God told Moses in the burning bush, it's recorded in Exodus chapter 3, that his eternal and memorial name unto all generations was and is I am. And that has a sense of not someone created or uh, coming into existence by some other force, but just eternal self-existence. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. We have the same sense in, in the name Je- Jehovah, L-O-R-D, all, all capital letters. Uh, but God is so much more than the deist God that is just some power or force, all power with no personality. Our God has a nature and, and a character that he, uh, he reveals to us. Uh, manifests in, uh, in a general sense in creation and in our conscience and in the, the way that he works in the affairs of, of man. We see that historically and very specially. Certainly he reveals himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his word, the Holy Scriptures. And God's word and his, his words uh, reveal his choices and, and actions what he has done and what he will yet do in this phrase that he says or starts off, I will. Uh, the choices that he makes in several places and in our text tonight, he says, I will. And then he continues on and we understand who he is and, and what he's thinking and what he's going to do because he tells us right in his word. And so the, the title of the message tonight is When the I Am Says I Will. When the I am says I will, and the title uh, leads to our text in the book of Hosea, uh, chapter 2. No brain fires now, uh, no exploding heads. Hosea, Hosea, uh, (laughs) Old Testament, somewhere after Isaiah, somewhere before Malachi. Um, I started Isaiah, and then I, I usually stop at Daniel and say, what's the next one? And then I think D.H., and I don't know why that comes to my head, if it's D.H. Buffet or designated hitter in baseball, D.H., and then I go Hosea, and then I have some other weird way of remembering where to go after that. So I'm not just telling you stories, I'm giving you a chance to, <laughs> to find where we're going to be tonight. And so we're going to be primarily in, in chapter 2, where from verse 14 down to the end of the chapter, verse 23, God reveals himself to Israel and to us via at least a dozen I wills. And again, the whole uh, point being, uh, we'll build, build the context, of, of course, as we get in here, but just in a general sense, when God says, I will, and he tells us some action he's going to do, that tells us a lot about him, his character, nature, his moral attributes, and, uh, which specifically are those attributes which relate to his relationship with, with us. And hopefully we would sit here tonight and say, Well, I want to know that. I want to know more about how he interacts uh, with uh, mankind in general and me specifically. And so we're going to look at uh, these I wills tonight in in, uh, chapter 2 here of Hosea. And collectively, they paint just an amazing, an amazing, amazing... (laughs) God uses repetition as his volume control. I guess I'm trying to do the same thing. An amazing portrait of God's grace. And again, that's... Our focus this this year, and maybe that's why I was uh, why the Lord led me to this particular book tonight, and this particular chapter. So the book of Hosea, uh, hopefully you've uh, found it, and you're sitting there staring at it, saying, "Hmm, that's an interesting name. What does it uh, What does it mean? Uh, names mean a lot in the Word of God." And this uh, the title of this book, the prophet has a sense of the deliverer, the deliverer. And it's interesting as you kind of chase that name and and see where else it it is in the scriptures, it leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ, believe it or not. We have Hosea, and and, uh, we know Joshua as Joshua, (laughs) Uh, but we start off being introduced to him as uh, Oshea, and so really it's the same name, just spelled a, a little different in Numbers chapter 13. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. And so uh, God is telling Moses to kind of build on his name. Again, Hosea meaning 
deliverer. And he says, well, uh, Moses called his name uh, Jehoshua. So you still have the, the deliverer part in there, but now you add Jehovah. So Jehovah deliverer, or however, you know, depending upon how you want to interpret those two, Jehovah delivers or Jehovah the deliverer or Jehovah delivered, Jehovah has delivered me, something along those, those, those lines. But we have uh, the deliverer in Jehoshua, or we know him more as Joshua, as it's somewhat contracted, which takes us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Je uh, Jesus says, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Savior or deliverer. Uh, and imagine that, uh, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So just looking at a, at a prophet in the Old Testament and looking at his name, it, it, it leads us to Jesus Christ. Amen, hallelujah for that. Now, on the one hand, just starting with that, just the name of the book and its, and its meaning, the name of the prophet. On the one hand, uh, there is no deliverance from the law of sowing and reaping. In chapter 2 and verse 10, says, and now will I discover her lewdness. The her is speaking of Israel, and if you're familiar at all with the book of Hosea, it's, it's a, a story of a horrible marriage. And I almost feel weird standing up tonight after this morning, the first marriage, and, and a beautiful look at marriage, and now we go to Hosea, and it's a horrible, awful relationship of uh, this woman, this wife, Israel, with her husband, uh, Jehovah, the I am that I am. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. And that's interesting, uh, just that whole thought. When we start with this book means deliver her, or the name of the, the prophet. Uh, if you go back to chapter 1, kind of interesting how God sets it up and, and we're You know, there's a phrase that preachers use that I use that I hate. <laughs> I hate to say it, and I hate to hear it. It's, uh, for the sake of time, we're just not going <laughs> to go down here, there, or there. And so if I say that a few times tonight, here's how I'm going to make it up to you, Lord willing. Uh, and you can pray about this. Uh, Pastor Sargent is uh, close to finishing up uh, the, the uh, auditorium Sunday school class on... Uh, church history and lining up of course with brother Alexander uh, coming because that's what he's going to be focusing on so great timing there and then shortly thereafter that Sunday school series is going to come to an end and uh, I feel bad because I'm having such a good time learning in there uh, but we were talking about uh, perhaps myself teaching through a book of the Bible and unless God gives other direction uh, I'll tell you now this this is where I'm going to be the book of Hosea and so that's, uh, if I don't get to the entire book, every verse tonight, or even all of chapter two, uh, my plan is to see if the Lord might, might let me come back and, and work, work, with it through, uh, work with you through it on Sunday mornings. Um, so anyway, on the one hand, no deliverance from the law of sowing and reaping. Chapter one, verses two through five, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go... Take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And uh, again, we're just trying to see that even though the name, Hosea's name means deliverer, in one sense we see in this entire book that there is not a deliverance from the biblical law, God's law of sowing and reaping. And his wife, Israel, committed great whoredoms and she reaped what she had sown. And uh, God does not, at least initially, deliver her from those consequences. 
And this, so this is one of the themes that runs throughout the book of sowing and reaping. And, and that name, Jezreel, means uh, God sows. Uh, God sows. Uh, chapter 10, uh, there's an exhor- exhortation to Israel and encouragement to sow the right way. Uh, and yeah, eventually we're going to get back to chapter 2. We're trying to give a, a, a bigger picture to start off here and we'll, we'll hone in. But chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. And certainly we would understand in the New Testament, we're taught as a New Testament church, as Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, this this law, it didn't start in the New Testament. This is God's law, the law of sowing and reaping. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Uh, For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Uh, But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. So, on the one hand, no deliverance from this law. We sow and we reap uh, accordingly. On the other hand... uh, it's inexplicably, uh, or inexplicably, though it is explicit in our text, as we'll see, it's just hard to understand. The Lord is loving and gracious and merciful and forgiving and ultimately delivering and saving unto an everlasting, intimate relationship. And hopefully, there's an amen. I know I said it fast. I know there's a lot of stuff there. But hopefully you said there's some good stuff about God in there and his grace. And I'll amen that because I need that grace. Uh, The end of chapter 2. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. He's speaking of Israel. I will sow her unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. So that name, Jezreel, it's a place name in the Old Testament. It's a name of the first son of Hosea and the the wife of Hordom that he took as directed Gomer. Again, means uh, God will sow. God will sow. And so you see that name, kind of popping up in that thought of, of sowing and reaping throughout. And uh, here's, here would be an outline of the book as a whole. Starts off the first three chapters. Well, it starts off the, the book. If there is a, a, a key word, and I hate to say that, one of the key words would be the word whoredom in the singular or, or plural whoredoms. It, it repeats itself over and over and over again related to Israel as a wife of, of the Lord. And so in chapters 1 through 3, we have Israel as the Lord's wife of, of uh, great uh, whoredom, idolatry. Uh, there is a separation, but there is an allurement, and we'll be looking at that tonight, unto a reconciliation. Uh, those are the opening three chapters. Chapter 4, up through uh, the middle of verse 9 of chapter 13, is not very fun reading. Uh, It's not happy-go-lucky, hey, let me read uh, historical uh, chronicling of of what Israel did in the Old Testament. It's it's hard to get through because it chronicles Israel's awful sowing and her her reaping. And it kind of uh, ends in the middle of verse 9 of chapter 13. And from there then to uh, the end of the book, chapter 14, we have a call to repentance Uh, We have the Lord's love just shining through and then a sober reminder of that law of sowing and and reaping. So kind of in in three parts, really the themes run cover to cover from from the first verse to to the last verse. And we're going to be in that first section, uh, primarily in in chapter 2, and I'm going to read the whole chapter. I find that it's more accurate that way than me trying to summarize what chapter 2 is about and then working our way through it. 
It might even be quicker just reading it than having me try and explain it to you. Certainly it, it will be more, uh, more accurate. And I've been debating whether to read from my big Bible or my little Bible. The little Bible has self-pronunciation guides, but the font is smaller. So I think I'm going to re uh, read from my bigger Bible. And you can forgive me if, I, if you would pronounce some of these words different. No one here probably speaks Hebrew, so I think we're safe. So chapter 2 of Hosea. Say ye unto your brethren, Amai, and to your sisters, Ruama, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will cause her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. Uh, and if you're depressed up to this point, you likely should be at least at what Israel has done to the Lord. But you got to keep reading because the Lord comes shining through now with incredible love and grace and mercy. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord. And, and I want you to start asking yourself, because we see this reference three times in this, this chapter. That day. That day. When is that day? When is that day? That day. And it shall be at that day saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Yishi, and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And here it is again, that day. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass, there it is again, in that day. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. Again, God will sow. 
And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. I have a thesis, and uh, normally I would, I guess, try and drive a, a thesis towards the application. Here, uh, the thesis is more uh, the interpretation of, of this chapter, and, and certainly at the end, as we conclude, we'll be making uh, prayerfully great applications to our lives as a church and as individuals. Uh, but trying to sum up uh, chapter here, 2 here, our text for tonight, Uh, I look at the transition between verse 13 and verse 14, the end of 13 and then rolling into the beginning beginning of 14, and just sum it up this way. Israel allured lovers and forgot the Lord. The Lord covenants to remember and allure Israel. And before you start to hear Pastor Geist's voice as uh, Charlie Brown teacher, wah, 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 or maybe the sun's coming in on your side and you're you're getting sleepy and tired, before that happens, and prayerfully it won't, uh, while you still have a lot of electricity firing through your brain, I want you to think about this. Uh, And it's it's a subtlety of one word that you probably wouldn't catch but I find it just hugely significant. And uh, it applies to this. The best we typically do in a situation like this that might be applied in, in our life would be to take the right actions. We would follow what the Lord is uh, uh, says. I will, I will, I will. And we say, well, if he will, then I will. I'll follow the actions that, that the Lord lays out for me. At best, if we, if we can even get to that, that point. Uh, But I think there's a a point beyond that that this passage can lead us to. And and prayerfully, as we work through it tonight, the Holy Spirit can do that. Here's how I would uh, maybe apply this in my life. Uh, I will allure uh, someone that has uh, done some great ills against me in, in a relationship. I will allure them back into this relationship in spite of them uh, forgetting me. In spite of everything they've done, I will do this. I will take the upper hand. And this is how it would read if I was writing it, because every time I I read through from 13 to 14, I put in a different word. And then I have to stop and say, God God doesn't have that connecting word. Uh, It would go something like this. And... uh, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. But in contrast to what she or what they did to me, in contrast to that, but I'm going to act the right way. But this is how I would write it if this, was, if this was me, just being honest with you. But behold, I will allure. I will win this, this person back. And then I have to stop and, you know, rub my eyes and say, well, that's not what uh, the Holy Spirit wrote in there uh, for this connecting word. He didn't put in this contrasting, but uh, it is what it is. She went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. Therefore, behold, look at this. Here's what I'm going to do. I will allure her and, and we'll step through those those I wills. So I would say I will allure in spite of them forgetting me. Um, and that's if we're willing to uh, willfully forgive in the first place to get to that point. But God says I will allure because of them forgetting me. This this therefore. And I hope I'm not just babbling it. it, it, it uh, as I've meditated on this, it, it makes sense to me, it makes sense to me that I normally fall short, even if I'm taking the right actions, that God said, be, not, they did this, but I'm going to do this. It's they did this, 
Therefore, because of that, I'm going to lure, I'm going to do that much more to make myself alluring and, and attractive and, and, and win back that relationship. And here's uh, the outline. It's the, the word, the next word in verse 14, uh, behold, which means look. Now look at what? The I wills. And so our outline is simply looking at uh, the I wills, the I will allure and it, uh, dot, 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 continuing on from there. Uh, a lot of the, the teaching, just trying to set up the, the big picture of the book, what it's about, what it's representing is, is done. Uh, so now it's, a lot of it is maybe easy just meditating on the pieces, parts of I will. I will, and just letting the Holy Spirit stack those one upon another into our hearts and souls and, and uh, prayerfully our, our spirit as we would try to align our thoughts with, with God's thoughts um, as he reveals his, his moral attribute of love and all of its different manifestations to us in these, these I wills. So let's start off. We're just going to step through these, really just step through from that point to the end of the chapter and make some applications uh, so verse 14 and 15, I will allure her. So there's, you know, a conscious decision, God exercising his, his will. I will allure her. And, and, and so it's targeted of who he's trying to allure and who he's trying to allure her to himself. And maybe it's because I'm from Minnesota. And we have 10,000 lakes, and a few of them have some fishing in them that I've, I've fished for. Uh, many more mosquitoes. But I look at the word allure, and I just see the word lure there. Are there any other fishermen that like that? And there's a big fisherman down here. Okay, just write me off as a crazy Minnesotan. But it's the same thought. Allure, lure is part of the word allure. And so I just think of myself, you know, out there on West Beach with a buzz bomb. And what am I trying to do with a lure? I'm trying to get the attention of hopefully a nice salmon that I can put on the, the, the grill, a plank it. And I'm, I'm trying to get the attention of the fish and trying to get them as rapidly as possible to come after my, my lure. And that might be, that's just what I thought of this uh, allurement. Uh, you can uh, think of your own way of, of alluring, but and it's not like God's throwing a, a buzz bomb or some flashy... Uh, fishing lure out there in front of Israel it's himself it's it's the real thing a lure is trying to replicate a, a fish but here's God God himself and Israel in the preceding verse it doesn't use the word alluring but the, the thought is there she's alluring everyone else but her husband the, the, the Lord and she did it in involving uh, smell and sight and, and adornment, likely her words too. Uh, it doesn't really say that here, but her, uh, she burned incense to them. She decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers. She's trying to allure them in that manner, and he comes back and says, well, if you're doing that, again, not you did that, but you're doing that, I'm going to allure you, and I'm going to show you that a relationship with me is so much better, and you're trying to allure your lovers in this manner, and I'm going to allure you that way. And, and again, here's where I just want to throw down a marker maybe for when, uh, if and when we get into this in a, in a Sunday school um, series uh, that we'll examine this uh, some more. And you can on, on your own. All the ways in which God allures Israel. I will allure. I will bring her into the wilderness. And at first you might think, well, that doesn't sound very alluring. Uh, the wilderness, that sounds like a desert place. It's not where I'd want to live. It's not where I'd want to go on a, a, a date. It's not where I'd want to go with someone in a relationship. That wa And there, even in this book, even in this chapter, chapter 2 and verse 3, there is a sense of wilderness being a dry land, a desert place, for example, that slays with thirst. So there is that use of, of wilderness in, in the scriptures. But it doesn't make any sense in the context here. So there must be another sense of the word wilderness 
If, if God is saying, I will allure you back uh, and, and make, the, make myself as attractive as possible, a relationship with me as opposed to a relationship with all these lovers that, that you're chasing, then the wilderness can't be all bad. There's got to be, be good. And also, uh, so again, in this book, uh, chapter 13, there is a different sense of the wilderness where there are pastures there. Uh, chapter 13, verses 5 and, and 6. Uh, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. So there's the sense of, okay, a, a desert type of place. But then verse 6 says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. And so coming out in the wilderness is not just, I'm going to bring you to a place where there's nothing to drink, nothing to eat, no pasture. He uses the sense later on that even before this alluring, he had brought them into the wilderness and given them pasture. Now, sadly, if you would continue to read, well, I will, verse 6, they went with him to the wilderness. He gave them pasture. They ate. They were filled to the point of forgetting him. Uh, and their heart was exalted, and therefore have they uh, forgotten me. But, uh, again, that's just showing the sense that don't think, well, that's weird. He's contradicting himself. I'm alluring you out into the desert. No, into the wilderness, but to a, a, a pasture. Uh, this is used uh, also in one of the Psalms. Let me just quick read from Psalm 65. Uh, the same sense of a pasture in, in the wilderness. 65, uh, verse 11 and 12. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness. And the little hills rejoice on every side. I'll just read the next verse. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. So, uh, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness, but the sense of the pastures there. Uh, the next one, I will speak comfortably unto her. And now you're going to, you know, I asked you the other question. It says, in that day, in that day, in that day. And you're so, a part of your brain may be back here if uh, your thoughts are wandering from where we are. That day, that day, that day. When is that day that he's talking about? Okay, put that one on park. Now take another part of your brain for this question. And this one you can't just kind of set aside. You need to think uh, right off the bat here. When... From the birth of this nation, you know, went down as a family into Egypt, came back up a nation. So from the birth of the nation on up to today, prophetically looking forward, take it all the way out to eternity. When would or when will Israel most need to be comforted? You might think when they had water in front and nowhere to go behind and there was a bunch of chariots back there, they needed some comfort there, and, and God did that. He did the blast of his nostrils, and, and they went through, and blast of his nostrils, and the waters came back, and they got uh, comfort there. That would be a, a place. Maybe you think uh, all the way into the uh, 20th century, uh, 1948, uh, we were there, was it this, this morning or Sunday school? I can't remember. 1948, must have been Sunday school, marching forward in time. And someone said correctly, 1948, Israel was rebirthed as a nation. And the U.S., Harry Truman, led us to be the first country to recognize her. Did she need uh, some comfort there? When she was surrounded by her enemies that wanted to immediately stomp her out. You're a nation? Okay, psh, that lasted about a day. Uh, but God steps in and uh, uh, miraculously s spoke comfortably uh, to her there, won a great victory. And you could add all the other years of the uh, Arab-Israeli wars where she could have gotten stomped out and God just kept stepping in, stepping in, stepping in. How about the Holocaust? Uh, I would say she needed to be spoken to comfortably there. I would say even beyond that, though, looking forward, there's a day yet coming, it's at least seven years off, uh, when she's going to need 
uh, a comfort that she's uh, not needed even in all those places we've thought about. Uh, doo -doo -doo, we hear the trumpet. Whoosh, prayerfully, we look around at each other. We'll all be taken out in, in what we refer to as the rapture. God pours his wrath out on Israel. And by the end of Daniel's 70th week, Jerusalem is surrounded by her enemies. And if, if, if we are correctly interpreting the prophet Zechariah, it seems two-thirds of the nation will be destroyed in this, this battle. And the one-third uh, that are left see that they're about to be obliterated. I find this point in time to be the time that... Uh, she needs the greatest words of, of comfort, and she calls out uh, for them. And thinking about that, in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 40, it takes on new meaning for me. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, we get to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah is the mini Bible, 39 chapters, or 39 chapters up to this point, 39 books in the Old Testament. And uh, I typically preach, and I, I believe it's, it's uh, a correct thought uh, that... Chapter 40 then points us to the beginning of the New Testament, the 40th book, which starts the Gospels. And so we go and, and we see John the Baptist. But before we see John the Baptist, we read these words that I read, verse 1 and 2. And I uh, am reading the Lord say, I will speak comfortably unto her. And he did and he tried. <laughs> and they rejected those words of comfort. Uh, we get to John the Baptist, and, he, and he, he, he's the forerunner of Christ, uh, the Prince of Peace, uh, the one who is to offer comfort to them. And, and God wants to speak comfortably, and, she, and it's like she has her finger in her ears and just rejects it. And John preaches, and, and Christ presents himself, and they say, crucify him. Ah. Uh, I think I have a better understanding of those words at the beginning of chapter 40 of Isaiah and the sadness that, that she rejected them. But I, I don't believe that's the only I will speak comfortably unto her. That was one fulfillment of that, but it's pointing us further down the road to when they can't reject him, when they call to be saved. At the end of Daniel's 70th week, uh, they rejected that comfort and those words of comfort. But as Paul wrote to uh, the Corinthians, we don't have to. Uh, that same God of all comfort speaks to us comfortably. And, and, and we're not to sit there with, with our fingers in our ears, uh, covering up our hearts, stopping that comfort from reaching us. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And praise the Lord, we won't be going through her tribulation. Uh, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And uh, that's a blessing to me, uh, that we have that comfort and that God of comfort that speaks comfortably to us that prayerfully we've not rejected. And it maybe brings me through, making the personal application there, brings me through uh, the, just the horrible thoughts of Israel continuing to reject the words of, of comfort. But he says, I will. I will. Part of his alluring as I will speak comfortably unto her. I will give her her vineyards from thence. And we read that she did not know, the Lord speaking, that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. 
And so he says he takes it away. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and, and my wine. But here he says in this allurement, I will give her her vineyards from thence. I will give her the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Well, what's the significance of this valley of Achor? Well, do you remember Jericho? Uh, Jericho, Jericho. There's probably a better kid's song. I don't know. Uh, they went into the, the promised land and they, they battled and they weren't to take anything, you remember? And someone saw and uh, uh, lusted after, coveted, and took silver, gold, Babylonish garment. And that sin of a- Achan troubled the entire nation. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? This is one of the places where God is telling us what a word means as he just describes it. Troubling, a trouble, being troubled. Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee. This day, and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor uh, unto this day. So what's the significance? It was a a place where they were troubled, a valley of, of trouble. But he says, the one who's alluring, wooing, winning back unto an everlasting relationship. He says, I will give her the valley of Achor for a door of hope. So we have a a valley of her troubles, but God is going to have this door of hope. And uh, this is where you teach teach me because we've taught you that hope is not wishful thinking, right? Uh, I hope my troubles will disappear in this valley. No, not that kind of hope. It's a confidence and confident and patient expectation in God's promises. Uh, I hope in this. Not, I don't hope in this. I hope in this. Because God's not a man that he should lie. Uh, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Uh, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience. Uh, wait for it. And that patience is part of hope. Uh, We expect confidently and patiently. And how can we be patient? Because we have God's word on it. A door of hope. Valley of trouble, but I will give her the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And that door of hope must be walked through. Uh, We pause the I wills to let her respond. He's been alluring. I will. I will. I will. He's alluring, wooing her back to him. We pause and see her response. She shall sing. Where is she going to sing? In the valley of Achor, this valley of trouble, wherein opens a door of hope. Uh, How is she going to sing? As in the days of her youth. As in the day when she came out of the land of, of Egypt. Can you think of any song that she sang when she came out of Egypt? And blub, 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 blub. (laughs) The chariots were were underwater, and she's now on the other side, and she's rejoicing, and Moses and uh, his sister are are leading them in song. And that's that's exactly what it says. As in the day when they... uh, She came up out of the land of Egypt, and you don't have to think just kind of ethereal about that. Uh, We have a song that she sang, and God's saying... She's going to sing that song. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, just a few verses from Exodus 15. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. Jump into verse 11 of Exodus 15. That was verse 2. 
Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? She's going to go back to singing that as opposed to going after all those other gods. Now he's alluring, and she's being allured. She's being wooed back into this relationship, and she's singing this song. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Verse 13, thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Think about her singing that, this holy habitation that she's being guided back to, an eternal habitation with the one who has wooed her, won her, allured her. She shall sing and she shall call at that day. When is that day? Well, I tell you what, I've narrowed it down to this. (laughs) Somewhere at the end of Daniel's 70th week, when she finally calls upon the name of the Lord, and he responds and takes her from this most incredible battle to world peace, (laughs) and this habitation that that she's going to have. She will call in in that day. Um, Thou shalt call me Ishi. What is that? (laughs) It doesn't sound very nice. Uh, Maybe it's because I'm not pronouncing it right. It has a sense of, uh, thou shalt call me my husband. A sense of... uh, a very intimate relationship of love. And shall call me no more Baali. Well, what's this Baal, Balaam, Baali? Uh, that's Lord or Master. In its worst sense would be just one of the false gods of, of the world that are not gods. So that would be a relationship of, of authority. Lord, Master. And so in this singing, after she has been wooed back, she speaks and calls the Lord not out of a relationship of of authority only, Baali, but calls him Ishi, my husband, a name within their relationship of, of love. And I will take away the names of Balaam out of her her mouth. And they shall no more be remembered by their name. I will make a covenant for them with, with beasts. Verse 18, I'll not read that again, but my mind went to Isaiah 65 and verse 25, speaking of this time that uh, this whole text is transitioning us into, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the servants or serpents' meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Uh, Also in verse 18, I will break the bow and the sword and and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And that question of when is this day, when is that day, that day, that day that this, this is pointing to? Well, that day that transitions from the greatest Bible battle to world peace world peace and and in verse 19 and and 20 uh, I will betroth thee unto me I will uh, I will allure thee I will woo thee I will do all these things and now here's the legal pronouncement I will betroth thee unto me for ever. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed in your name remain. That's in the last chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66 and verse 22, which points to the last book of the Bible, the Revelation. I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in rightness in a in a moral sense certainly in a a legal sense this betrothal so to yourselves 
in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Uh, This betrothal of Israel unto uh, the Lord in righteousness is not just a little sprinkling of, of righteousness. It's a deluge of reigning righteousness upon her. I will betroth thee unto me in judgment. Here is the legal pronouncement of the betrothal by a judge, the judge, God, the judge of all. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. And he is the judge pronouncing this betrothal of her unto he. I will betroth thee unto me in loving kindness. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. I will betroth thee unto me in mercies. There's a a parallel chapter to chapter 2 here of Hosea. A lot of parallels over in the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 54. And listen there to similar thoughts of Israel and her husband and his mercies. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Uh, That, you know, God's sense of time is just a tad bit different than ours for a small moment Hosea is writing uh, finishes up the book in uh, 725 BC so we get 725 years add 2022 uh, add seven years to that and then whatever until the rapture on top of that To us, that seems like a long time, hundreds and thousands of years. To the Lord, it's but a small moment, but a small moment. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Uh, Again, that's in the similar passage over in Isaiah 54, verses 5 to 7. I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And there it is again, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. Uh, that was speaking more to the southern kingdom as she was going into captivity here. We're primarily speaking of the, the northern kingdom as she was about to go into captivity. A similar thought, though, certainly applicable. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. Think of the whoredoms uh, spelled out in the book of Hosea related to Israel. Uh, but it is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We get down to the end of this betrothal section. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And then see the conclusion at the end of verse 20. And thou shalt know the Lord. And I believe that's uh, in its greatest intimate sense, as was read this morning, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, uh, Genesis 4 and verse 1. You know, every part I read, I just want to stop and meditate on and just say, Selah. Uh, There's some more I will, so we'll make it to the end of the chapter. I will hear, verses 21 and 22, unto fruitfulness. Uh, They shall hear, Jezreel, God will sow. And he says, I will sow. I will sow Israel unto me. I will have mercy upon her 
that had not obtained mercy, and part of this is back in chapter 1, the references here, looking backward, but we're looking forward to that day. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. When is this going to (laughs) happen? When is that day? That day? That day? I believe Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9 has the answer. And I will bring the third part through the fire. And will refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. And I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Again, the end of Daniel's 70th week. Went through all her you know, valley of Achor, valley of incredible troubles that we can't even imagine even though we read about it. In, in the word, she gets to a point where she is wooed back and she can do nothing but look up and call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Paul references this end of chapter 2 in his letter to the Romans, chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And if we go and teach through this, uh, we'll spend some more time looking at that and how the Gentiles uh, might fit into that. Well, I got to conclusion. And, you know, if we just stop there, uh, prayerfully we would say, Glory to God for his amazing grace towards Israel. And it would be a great prayer, prayerfully, it's been a great Bible study for me so far, and I plan on continuing it. And prayerfully, you've learned some good things from the Word of God. You're more Bible knowledgeable, but uh, in, in uh, drawing this together, uh, certainly we need to make some applications that would, would bring it home and make it uh, that much more profitable than just Bible knowledge. So recapping just a chronology of this writing, Hosea's writing concluded about 725 B.C. 725 B.C. What happens about five years later? Uh, The Assyrians come in, and she goes into captivity. Proof positive of, on the one hand, there is no deliverance from reaping what we've sown. And she did in the Assyrian captivity. Uh, I'm a a little less Bible pounding in my chronology of Isaiah chapter 54, the parallel, uh, somewhat parallel passage. Uh, But one source I was looking at says that that particular chapter, with a lot of the same promises of uh, the alluring and, and the restored relationship, was written about seven. Uh, 712 B.C. You know, five, ten years after the captivity. So on the one hand, Hosea here is writing before she goes into captivity, and God's saying, I will, I will, I will. She doesn't listen, she goes into captivity, uh, the valley of, of being troubled. But shortly after she goes into captivity, God moves Isaiah to write similar thoughts. So it's almost like now she's on the other side and God's still saying the same thing because he's still the same God. He he doesn't change. (laughs) And he's encouraging with this affirmation, thy maker is thine husband and with great mercies will I gather thee. That's just beautiful the way the Lord used the prophets. Well, let's make some applications. Uh, How about a marriage relationship? Certainly, this is uh, about uh, a restored uh, marriage relationship that had gone uh, crazier, worse, more sour than any uh, marriage we could, uh, I believe we could think of on the earth. The marriage relationship, God uh, the Father with with Israel, there is this betrothal and and reconciliation. 
And what is the application there? Well, uh, I would say the application is, is this, and, and I don't say this glibly and lightly like this is a light topic, but I believe a very true and real application is that adultery in a marriage is, is not a command to divorce. Uh, Jesus did teach what some might refer to as the fornication loophole. Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. It has been said, uh, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. The Lord did separate himself from Israel. There were consequences of her whoredoms. And those consequences are continuing, ongoing to this day. But if someone you know, comes to me and says, well, this has happened in, in my marriage, I can, I can divorce, right? Look, it's right there in the scriptures. I find myself going to Hosea chapter 2 and saying, let's look at God. <laughs> uh, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord uh, thy Redeemer. That could be one application. Another application of the thought of, of a marriage. Uh, this is God the Father, a restored marriage relationship with Israel. We're a New Testament church. That's not talking about us in spite of the, the false teaching of replacement theology. And we are the Israel of today. No, Israel is Israel, and the New Testament church is a New Testament church, and Bible Baptist church is not Israel. We're Bible Baptist church, a New Testament church, and we have a marriage to look forward to. Do we not? The marriage of the Lamb, our, our bridegroom, and God the Son uh, is making preparations for that marriage let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. That's beautiful to think of that preparation that's going on, but we have our part as, as part of the bride. Uh, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, the Bible Baptist Church, hath made herself ready. Oh, what are we supposed to be doing to make ourselves ready? Well, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It's reading from Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, just some thoughts on not God the Father's marriage, but when we're, as we're looking at that, and how that's going to be restored, we're looking at the marriage that we have to look forward to. The groom, the Lamb of God, making his preparations, we too are to be making prepar uh, preparations to be presented uh, without spot, uh, without blemish. Um, but let's finish by making application of just relationships in general. And start off putting ourselves in the place of Israel, and you'd say, that's horrible. <laughs> uh, even though I haven't, you might say, I haven't recently read the book of Hosea. Just what we looked at tonight, just one chapter, and what you said, just what it's about, how could you say <laughs> to put yourself in the place of, of this a woman of, of great uh, whoredoms? Uh, well, there might be someone that's just saying, in my relationship with my, my God, uh, I have... I have cheated on him. I've tried to allure others, lovers in the world, idols, things, to the point where I've just so ruined my relationship with the Lord. I've just destroyed it. <laughs> there's, 
There's no way he would take me back. Uh, But if we were preaching the end of the book instead of the the beginning, I would have taken you to chapter 13 and verse 9. I believe the only other place I've ever preached from in this this book. Uh, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. There's, she's reaping what she's shown, sown. Uh, but in me is thine help. And if that's not a, a verse of uh, hope that just blasts through, uh, blasts through all the fog of your thoughts that maybe you've destroyed your relationship with the Lord, no. Uh, he'll take you back. And in, in fact, if that's you today, he's, tr- he's trying to allure you back and woo you back. Uh, With all of Israel's whoredoms against God, the Lord's stated choice uh, is to allure her, win her back, and you may feel that you've destroyed your life and any chance at a renewed relationship with God, but know that he chooses to allure you back. And if that's you tonight, I would simply ask, will you let him? Will you let him? Uh, Will you let him allure you and woo you back? Uh, but now let's, let's flip it, not with Israel and the Lord or, or us being Israel, but just a relationship, uh, one with another. And focus on uh, the I wills that God demonstrated for us, his actions and his attitude uh, toward the one that had uh, done him wrong. Uh, what would it mean to follow God's example? Are we willing to not only forgive someone, but are we willing to choose to allure them unto a renewed relationship? Has anyone ever done you wrong? Really wrong. Biblically wrong. Repeatedly wrong. Over an extended period of years to the point of a severed relationship. There certainly are consequences. We learn that in this book, sowing and reaping. And there will likely be a separation, just as we see in the book of Hosea. But we have an admittedly hard to fathom example of how to respond in both our actions and our attitude. And in those type of situations when we don't know what to do, I would say uh, we would do well to ponder uh, when the I am says, I will, and I do. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would be able to uh, sink the arrows of his word deep into our hearts and souls uh, tonight to make application.